All right. Good afternoon. My name is Turner Bitten. I'm the executive director here at Westview Media. I'd like to thank you for tuning in to the latest in our City Talk series. Today, we're joined by Michelle Hoon from Salt Lake City's uh, Department of Housing and Neighborhood Development. Uh, welcome, Michelle. We're glad to have you. Hi, Turner. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. Uh, before we get started, I'd just like to have a couple of housekeeping items that I'd like to mention. One, uh, Michelle and I are the only ones here on the Zoom conversation. Uh, if you have questions and you're watching live on Facebook, please feel free to submit them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can today. Uh, to get started, Michelle, why don't you give us just a little bit about your background and what you do for Salt Lake City? Certainly, I'm happy to do so. Um, so my title, it's a kind of a long title. Uh, <laughs> it is Project and Policy Manager over the Homeless Engagement and Response Team for Salt Lake City. Um, a few years back, our uh, council and administration both recognized the need for some uh, deeper supports for people experiencing homelessness in our community. And so they funded my position. Um, I came to uh, I came to Salt Lake City after serving in the homeless services world as a direct service provider for about 10 years. I worked for the road home, uh, did several different jobs um, there. Most recently oversaw uh, programming at the Midvale Family Shelter um, and then was able to move over to the city. Um, so the department that I work for is called Community and Neighborhoods. Community and Neighborhoods oversees lots and lots of different kinds of programming, everything from transportation to, uh, to low-income housing uh, support uh, and things like that. Um, the division of community and neighborhoods that I'm a part of is called uh, housing and neighborhood development. And that is all very specifically focused on uh, housing for people with very low incomes. Uh, and then homeless services um, on top of that. And the homeless services side is the stuff that I oversee. I have a couple of coworkers who work with me um, and we all work on different initiatives having to do with uh, homeless services and how those roll out in the city. Well, well, thank you. Um, I appreciate that introduction. Um, I think we should boil down, uh, what does your day-to-day -day, uh, job look like? So you mentioned policy, and then you also mentioned programming. So what does your day-to-day -day job look like? That's a good question. So my team actually oversees quite a few things. I would say that the biggest thing that we um, that we oversee is what happens with people who are living unsheltered in our community. Um, so there's all kinds of information that comes into the city. Uh, it can come in through the SLC mobile app, which I'll talk more about if I can get a chance to um, a little bit later. And, uh, or it can come in through phone calls or emails uh, or things like that. People who are just out in the city and they're concerned about somebody that they see who's experiencing unsheltered homelessness. That information used to go to lots of different places in the city. It would either go to the police department or it would go to the parks department or, uh, you know, just different places. We decided that we needed to consolidate all that in one place. So all of that information actually comes to my team. And what my team does is we try to figure out what the most appropriate intervention is going to be uh, for that person, whether it is sending an outreach worker out uh, to meet with that person because they had not engaged with somebody before, um, all the way up to trying to plan um, a cleanup and a closure of a large encampment that has become problematic or dangerous um, throughout the community. There are also some other uh, things that are also very important um, that my team does. One of them is uh, to facilitate different types of connection with people who are uh, living in our homeless resource centers. As you probably know, I'm sure everybody knows, um, our, our community embarked on a large shift uh, in the homeless services world uh, a couple of years ago. We broke up the large downtown shelter and shifted to a um, shifted to a scattered site model with several new shelters um, throughout the community and those are permanent um, and those uh, two of those are hosted by Salt Lake City. Um, so one of the things that we knew we wanted to do in Salt Lake City was we wanted to try 
and create as many options uh, as we could to promote those as positive uh, neighborhood assets. We wanted to make sure that people who were living in the surrounding communities had lots of opportunities to volunteer, or to get to know the people who were living in the HRCs um, and to really be able to welcome them into the community. So we actually have a full-time position on our team who does that. Um, that's what she does. She tries to uh, just develop ways for people to be able to get together, to be able to um, facilitate uh, those meetings and those connections um, and things like that to make sure that people who are living in the HRCs feel welcomed by their community and people who are living in that community feel like they can feel some pride uh, in the fact that they're playing host to an HRC. Well, I, thank you. Uh, you mentioned several things that I know that we want to get into. Um, but the, the first, you mentioned uh, the scattered site model. And I, I think for folks uh, watching, it would be helpful if you could kind of explain the lay of the land. So how how is the new model structured and how I think at a, a, a most basic level, what are the different types of shelters and how would someone who is experiencing homelessness, how would they navigate that kind of system? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the, the basics, the very basics of it, we have three new homeless resource centers. So we used to have one large downtown shelter that uh, was closed and broken up into three separate resource centers. Two of those are in Salt Lake City. One of them is in South Salt Lake. Um, those operate year round. They're permanent facilities. They're not going anywhere. Uh, the, we know though that there is a points in the year at which we experience a greater need for, uh, for temporary shelter. For people, so some folks who may not necessarily engage in the summertime when the weather when the weather is fairly good, um, we do need to be able to shelter them in the winter time. So um, we the city works with works hand in hand in hand with what's called the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness, which I will also talk about. And uh, what we do is we come up with options for temporary shelter when we know that the weather is going to get super bad when we know that it's gonna be really cold outside. Um, there, that changes, that temporary shelter pl plan changes every year. Um, it is this year, what that looks like is it's a couple of different non-congregate shelters that we, uh, as the city and the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness worked together to find spots um, for people to go where they wouldn't have to be in congregate sites because of COVID-19. Um, that may or may not be the case going forward, sort of depending. We're seeing some positives and some negatives um, coming from that model. It's largely positive, though, I would say, uh, and fairly well received by the community. And um, so we are hoping that we will be able to, uh, that we'll be able to sort of continue this variation of services uh, for, as, for as long as as, as needed and as possible. Um, so I would say that the best way for people, like the easiest way to explain how people navigate that system, there is, they can either walk up uh, to the front door. We have what's called a no wrong door approach uh, with our community. That means somebody who needs shelter, they can walk up to an HRC and they can get into that um, Maybe not that HRC, but they can get into whichever HRC is going to be most appropriate for them. Um, they are segregated by uh, by gender, and our system actually shelters people based on gender gender identity, um, not on the gender that was assigned to them at birth. So uh, I think that that's a positive thing, <laughs> and uh, that we do have one facility that serves both uh, men and women. And those are just for adults. There's actually a kind of a separate system for families. Families that can go to the Midvale Family Resource Center and they can get help there. There's not like different, like several options for them. Uh, this is specific to single adults. The homeless resource centers are. Um, so you can either go, you can either walk up 
to a shelter and you can get help there. Or um, there is a phone number that you can dial if you want to, uh, if you want to inquire about options for shelter and what might be right for you. That phone number is 801-990-9999. Um, I can put that information in the chat to you, Turner, if you would like, and you can post it if you would like to do that. But um, it's pretty easy to remember. <laughs> it's 990-9999. Um, and that also will get you to the same organization that is in charge of making sure that people get to the right place. And that's actually Utah Community Action. So what you do is you walk into a shelter or you call this number and what Utah Community Action does is they actually start what's called the diversion process with you. So they start talking to you about what your situation is, why it is that you need to come to shelter. And if there's something that they could do to help you so that that's like pretty quick so that you don't actually have to access the system. So say that you are living with your sister and you've gotten in a fight with your sister and you don't feel like there's another place to go and you decide that you wanna to go to shelter. That person that's talking to you first when you very first show up, that person um, will try to mediate that situation so that you can go back to live with your sister if you need to. Uh, the reason that we do that is because we know that, and this sounds kind of tricky, um, but the thing that causes people to become homeless the second time is becoming homeless the first time. So if we can get people to engage with their community, they are going to have better outcomes than they would if they, uh, than they would if they enter the homeless services system unnecessarily. We want to make sure that people like if you're if you're in your community and you're feeling support in your community, then you you should be able to you should be able to to do that and to continue your life uh, in that way and um, you know be able to draw on the resources that are available to your community. Um, that being said, there's always a, there's always people who are going to experience a housing crisis. And so we know that we have to have emergency services there for people to catch them when they do end up in that situation and don't have another place to go. Well, thank you very much. And I, I promise to folks that are watching live, we're gonna dive into a lot of what has been mentioned. Um, I, I wanna get back to my pre-prepared questions just so that folks can understand how the system is laid out and then we'll get into some of the specific things that you mentioned. Uh, my next question is, uh, I imagine that your department or your organization interacts with many other departments within the city. I'm just wondering how that works and you know, how, how does your department work with law enforcement? How does it work with uh, the, the social work department within the, the police department? And if you just share that. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, it's, homeless services is such an interesting thing to be working in in the city because you literally do interact with every single department. Like, I don't think that there is a department that I have not interacted with since coming to the city, um, which is pretty, uh, pretty fascinating, I think, getting to get to learn a lot about how cities work. Um, so primarily what ends up happening is if somebody is uh, say like if somebody is living unsheltered, there are different organizations or there are different departments in the city that are going to naturally end up interacting with that person, whether it's the police department, whether it's the fire department, whether it's the parks department, whether it is our sustainability department, like with waste management and things like that. Um, there, are, there are lots of different departments that end up uh, sort of being involved uh, in that in that case in particular, um, what my team does is we try to just coordinate what is happening around each of those specific cases. So if we do have people who are living unsheltered in a park, one of the things that we'll do is we will uh, um, we stay in pretty close contact with our parks department. Um, to try to uh, coordinate the resources that are needed to get that person some help. So uh, what that looks like usually is a once a week meeting that we have with all of the different departments that are involved uh, in, this, in this subject area. And we all get together and we go through a list that we have um, of every 
report that has come into us about different people who are living unsheltered and we review every single one of those cases, the case conferencing basically. Um, and we talk about what is happening, is that location growing, is it shrinking, has outreach been able to reach out to those people, have we seen an increase in uh, like crime or have we seen an increase in um, health concerns like bio waste or needles uh, or things like that. And what can we do to help sort of remediate some of those things um, or mitigate some of those things before they end up becoming really big problems. Uh, sometimes uh, we're, we deploy lots and lots of different things, uh, lots and lots of different interventions to try to resolve a camp and it ends up not being able to, uh, we end up not being able to really get there. Um, and then we have to involve the Salt Lake County Health Department at that point. And that usually leads to what's called camp abatement. Um, and that, what that really is, is it is a, it's an attempt to resolve the public health issues that are associated with camping outside where the infrastructure of the city really isn't set up to support somebody who is living, uh, who's living in camped. Um, those usually only really happen with larger camps. Um, and that typically tends to be camps that there's not really like a specific size, I would say, like there's not like a threshold that's like, oh, you're above 10 people now, like that kind of thing, like we have to do something. Um, it's more focused on trying to gauge like what, what's the trash situation, what's the bio waste situation. Um, have we been able to put down things like porta potties? Have we been able to send out a cleaning contractor, which we do really frequently throughout the city, um, to try to pick up trash uh, and things like that? And if that stuff isn't helping, then we have to break up the camp, um, and people will uh, people will need to either uh, take shelter resources at that point or move to a different location. Thank you. Um, and, and I'd like to come back to the camp abatement topic, but mm -hmm. we'll do that uh, in the section that I like to uh, jokingly call our grab bag section because there's always a bunch of random questions. Uh, my, my next question, um, just for those that are watching, what is, in your view, the most important takeaway that viewers should have about the work that your team does? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I would like, I think that what I want people to understand is that there's such a broad range of people who experience homelessness and such a broad, uh, such a, like such a continuum of experiences that people have when this happens to them. It is very much an experience. It is often a, an experience that is very overwhelming and traumatizing for people, but it doesn't define who they are. Um, one thing that I think is very important is to make the distinction of people experiencing homelessness as opposed to homeless people. Uh, it is, it is very much a temporary situation for most people, uh, who end up, who end up experiencing it, they get out of it. And often, most times they get out of it on their own. Um, the, the services system that is set up to help people uh, is something that our team is really focused on trying to get people to engage with. We want to make sure, we want to see people take resources and we want to see people get help and we want to see people not be too, um, not be too disrupted in that process uh, because that really is important. I think that that's, um, that's something that uh, that is uh, definitely necessary. Um, people need people need a soft place to land. I think for sure. Um, but that there does uh, there does the the reality of the situation is that there does come a time when you do have to you do have to break up a camp or you do have to intervene with people in a in a way that is um, that is a, that does naturally disrupt them. But that we do not take that decision lightly. Um, that decision is made uh, in, in connection with lots of other agencies uh, and lots of other departments within the city and is something um, that we do when we know that it's actually like absolutely necessary. Well, thank you. Um, and my next question is about, I guess, the strategic vision or, or the ongoing priorities of your department, uh, your organization. What 
what is the what are the top priorities that you have as as an as a department or an organization? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm. One of the things that I absolutely want to make sure that we uh, that we are able to accomplish is this concept of positive neighborhood uh, uh, assets with our homeless resource centers. Um, that's tough to accomplish during COVID. I'm going to say <laughs> it's not easy when you can't get together. It's not easy when you can't have like in person events uh, and things like that. But we have been able to do some things that have been really cool and have really helped to, uh, I think, just sort of integrate the homeless resource centers into the fabric of the neighborhoods that are hosting them. One of those things uh, is we have been able to work with a local, um, a local business to partner with the women who live at the Geraldine King Center over on 700 South. And they started a, um, they started a clean team so what happens is those women, uh, they get together and they go out to the street and they clean, they clean that street. Um, and the people, uh, the organization that uh, sponsored this, they then provide those women with gift cards for their work, but they also have workers who go out and help with the cleanup too. Uh, and that's very cool. It's really, really cool to see people uh, who are staying at the center and people who are um, people who are housed neighbors getting together and talking with each other and getting to know each other. Um, and it always seems to go really positively. It always seems like the people who uh, both from both the unshelter or both the unhoused and housed community, um, they, they, you know, they get to understand each other a little better. Um, and I think that that goes so far uh, towards making, um, making a real community. Well, thank you. And I'm going to give you a break for just a second because I've asked you a bunch of questions in pretty rapid <laughs> succession. Uh, and remind folks, if you're watching live and you have questions, uh, we depend on audience questions. So if you uh, if you have any questions that you're sitting on, be sure to put them in the chat and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, my next question for you, uh, our organization is focused on the west side of Salt Lake City and we are now hosting a temporary shelter out at the airport. Inn. Yeah. Uh, wondering if you could talk about that and share kind of how that came about and, and how it's providing services here on the west side. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that program is great. We're we're very uh, we're very glad um, to the West Side community for being such a good host um, to to that program because it was very very necessary. I will say, um, and the the community has been so supportive and helpful, um, and we're really grateful to see that. So what the what that program is, we call it the Salt Lake Temporary Winter Housing Program um, at the airport in, is uh, that's a non-congregate sheltering facility. Um, that is run by a, an organization called Switchpoint, who has actually been running shelter in the St. George area for a number of years. And they actually just opened, I think, another facility in Twilla too. Um, they are, uh, they were very gracious and came to the Salt Lake Valley Coalition Tend Homelessness back uh, in the early fall uh, and let us know that we, um, that they would be willing to step up and be the shelter provider for overflow, for our overflow programs for this year. Um, we have great service providers in our community, but we don't have a ton of service providers that we can call upon to provide low barrier shelter. Um, and that is something that the, uh, that Switchpoint was uh, able to step up and provide for us, which is fantastic. Um, I ask you a real as I question? mentioned, oh, sorry, what? Can I ask a quick question? Yeah. What is a low barrier shelter? Oh, that's a good question. Yeah, so a low barrier shelter, what that means is uh, it's really client focused shelter and all of our, I will say that all of our facilities are low barrier shelters. So what we try to do is we try to remove the things that people identify as being stop gaps for them that cause them to not wanna come into shelter in the first place. So you can't come into shelter with your pet. You have to prove that you're sober. You have to, you can't be sheltered with your partner. You can't be, um, like you have to be in and out at a certain time, like those kinds of things. We do everything that we can to try to get rid of those barriers 
so that there is a place for somebody to go that is going to that's going to fit their needs. Um, and so uh, what the what we've been able to accomplish with the airport in is um, what we really wanted to focus on was couples. We really wanted to focus on uh, people, particularly who were living unsheltered and who were coupled up because we knew that that was a big gap in our community, that there were a lot of people who weren't coming in, weren't coming into our facilities because they didn't feel like they could be sheltered with their loved one. Um, also, I will say a lot of uh, situations that are like an adult uh, child and a parent who that adult child may not necessarily be able to um, live independently. Uh, and that was a gap. That was just a gap that we saw uh, in our system. And we knew that we needed to find something to try to resolve that. So when we were planning for what we wanted to do for overflow this year, that was the group of people that we were really focused on was trying to find shelter for those people. And we knew both with COVID and with sort of that family structure that you, you really need a little bit more privacy. So um, we were lucky enough to be approached uh, by the airport in and they, um, they let the, uh, the Salt Lake Valley Coalition tend to homelessness basically master lease that hotel and move people into it and serve them with on-site services. So what that, um, what that means is they have got case management on site. Um, they have got meals that are served to them. They get two meals a day that are served to them there. They've got on-site security. Um, and they also have uh, people who come over to work with them on different housing options. That is the absolute crux of the homeless services system and really of any homeless services system is one to try to shelter people, but really to try to get people out of shelter and into housing as quickly as possible. When somebody is no longer, like when somebody is in a house, they're no longer homeless. You have resolved their homelessness at that point. Doesn't necessarily mean that you've solved all of the things that have caused that person to become homeless, but chances are they're gonna do a much better job of being able to resolve those problems when they're in a place of their own, as opposed to when they're trying to navigate the shelter system, they're trying to figure out how to live on the streets, they're trying to just basically survive. If you're having to basically survive, you really can't get to those like higher levels. Uh, it's Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, <laughs> like you really can't like get up there uh, more and more if you if you don't have your basic needs met. Um, so shelter is definitely very important. The most important part uh, of any homeless services system is making sure that there is a funnel from that shelter into housing. Well, thank you very much. Um, my next question, I'm gonna take us to 10,000 feet really quick. Uh, <laughs> and I'd like to ask what your kind of just general approach or philosophy is to leading the team that you do. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, I mean, our guiding principle, and actually, like, I think the guiding principle for the entire state of Utah that has been for quite some time is actually housing first. And so that was what I was just talking about, <laughs> was making sure that, uh, that in everything that we do, we are paying very close attention to housing and what people, like, what the path is that people are on to get into housing. Um, we work particularly, so just something that can kind of be an example of that. If we have got somebody who is living unsheltered, but they are engaged with a street outreach worker and that street outreach, outreach worker is about to get them into housing, we don't move that person. Like we, we, we basically like do everything that we can, my team uh, and all of the different agencies and partners that we work with, we do everything that we can to try to keep that person stable as best as possible. Um, while not, you know, while making sure that like public health and safety are still being protected. Um, but we do everything that we can to try to make sure that we understand what is going on with that person. And we, um, you know, we give them the, the, the stability that is really necessary for them to be able to move directly from the street into a place uh, of their own, because we know that that's, we know that that's the goal. That's really like what you need to do is you need to get people into a stable place of their own. So that's really the grounding thing. That's the key is making sure that we understand what people, where people are at on their path to housing. Um, and if there are ways that we can support them as a city 
uh, into to achieving that goal and making sure that they can be stable and safe. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move into a little bit of the grab bag right now because you've mentioned several things as you've been speaking uh, that I think are important for us to circle back on. Um, one of the first things is you've mentioned uh, the service providers that we have here in our community and the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness. Can you share who the different service providers are, who operates which shelter, and then what is the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness? Sure. So I will actually start with the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness if I can. Anybody who is interested, who is watching this, please join the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness. It is an open forum, and anybody who is interested in this subject area can join it. What it is, is it is a very broad coalition of people. Uh, it is members of the government, uh, different service providers, people with lived experience, advocates, um, people who are just kind of generally interested uh, in the homelessness and housing. And it is a place for everybody to gather who is interested in this to try to affect policy, um, both on the city level and on the county level and on the state level. Um, what the, uh, what it, really is, um, is a, uh, it's called a continuum of care. And uh, what that is, is it is a um, HUD. So the federal government breaks communities up into geographic areas and basically says, all of you who are living in this geographic area who are doing things related to homeless services, you need to coordinate with each other. Um, and they score different communities based on how well you coordinate with each other. And if you coordinate with each other on a, like if you do well coordinating with each other and you kind of are of a certain population size, then you are likely to get more money from the federal government. And that is good. Um, more money from the federal government is definitely helpful. It helps us increase our ability to house people, helps us increase our ability to shelter people. But there's also, there, there's another benefit to it too, uh, to this coordination too, which is just better services for people experiencing homelessness. Um, if all of the different service providers are working in silos and the government doesn't know what they're doing, then it isn't gonna help anybody. Um, being, able to, uh, being able to coordinate with each other um, is the, like that's the way they actually like achieve outcomes and make sure that people are moving on that continuum from shelter to housing. Um, there are different focus areas. I think there's eight different focus areas. Um, they're called core function groups that are uh, part of the Salt Lake Valley Coalition Tent Homelessness. So if you have interest in a specific area, say you're really interested in legal rights and safety, you and how people who are experiencing homelessness are interacting with the criminal justice system. You can join the legal rights and safety uh, core function group. And what that does is, uh, it sends you to a meeting. Um, I think it's every other month that the core function groups meet. And you will meet with other people who are interested in that subject area. And you will try to identify different problems that are coming up within the community or the homeless services system. And you try to fix those. So I myself am a member of the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to End Homelessness. And I'm a member of two different core function groups. I'm a member of the crisis response core function group and the housing. Uh, core function group also. So those are both focused, crisis response is focused on shelter, um, and then housing is focused on housing. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Uh, um, and uh, what I am able to do with that is I am able to join different working groups or lead different working groups that are trying to tackle different problems. Uh, and one of those things, so one of the things I have been able to do as part of the Salt Lake Valley Coalition to Homelessness Crisis Core Function Group is have uh, is be able to participate in planning um, different overflow projects, and that was one thing that then led to the creation of the airport. In. Um, so it really is. I will say, um, if you are interested in this in this area and you want to affect policy in this area, that is the way to do it. Um, you can you can join the 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 coalition, and you can you can get your voice heard, and you can have some some actual real influence uh, on the system, which is cool. Thank you. Um, as far as the different service providers, so uh, we have got, 
a lot of service providers in Salt Lake City, and I'm not going to do them all justice, sadly, but I will highlight two service providers uh, that we do a lot of work with on my team. So the first is Volunteers of America. Uh, Volunteers of America runs the Homeless Youth Resource Center, they run uh, the Adult Detox Center that's in Salt Lake City, and they run lots and lots and lots of other programs. They also run the Geraldine King Center, uh, and they run um, most of our street outreach programs. So in the city, we actually have a city-specific outreach team that is part of, or that is staffed by Volunteers of America. One thing that I think that's important for people to know is that the city does not provide direct services. We are not a direct service provider, but we are a funder. Um, and that is, a, that's one way that we interact with the system. So as a city, if we have things that we want to see accomplished, we don't provide those services directly, but we contract with agencies like Volunteers of America to develop a street outreach program or to develop a new shelter or something like that. Um, so that's how we accomplish <laughs> um, those things. Uh, so Volunteers of America is fantastic. They are really great. They, uh, they are out there every day. They are, um, they're, uh, they coordinate with our team a great deal on unsheltered homelessness. They make sure to let us know what is going on with people who are living unsheltered, if they're seeing just like different trends in the population, if there are specific needs that the population has that we need to be aware of as a city, they let us know that stuff. And having that connection is super, super important to us. So they're fantastic. Um, the other one that I will, that I'll bring up is the Road Home. Uh, the Road Home operates the Gail Miller Center. Um, they used to operate the downtown shelter, but that is now gone. Um, they operate the Gail Miller Center. They also do a lot of work with housing. They uh, run several different housing programs um, that are located in the city. So the Wendell Apartments is one of those. Uh, Palmer Court is another one that I think people are probably familiar with. Um, and then lots of different scattered site, uh, scattered site places for people to live. One of the things that they do uh, is they serve as the um, as the coordinating agency for all different uh, agencies that are trying to get people housed and that what that what we call that is the triage process so if you've got a case manager who is working at the YWCA and they have got somebody that they know is experiencing chronic homelessness and they want to get them housed then they work really closely with um, with the road home and other agencies uh, to, to make sure that they get access to different housing vouchers or other subsidy programs that might be able to move that person from their shelter and into housing. Thank you. Um, I, I appreciate that. Um, the next thing I'd like to move on to, you, you mentioned earlier the SLC mobile app. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to give you a chance to share what that is and how folks can use that. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you get on the app store on your phone and you look up SLC mobile, what that is, is it is a, uh, it's a service request app. So you can put in information, say you are uh, biking along the Jordan River and you see somebody who you think needs help, but they don't like need help right then. Like they're not like bleeding. Uh, <laughs> they're just experiencing homelessness uh, in that area. What you can do is you can get on the SLC mobile app and that information then gets sent to my team. This is a good thing, I will say. Um, there's also lots of other things that you can report on the mobile app, like if there's a pothole on your street, you can report that and the city will come and fix it. Um, if there is a, like a downed, uh, like a downed tree or something that is like blocking things, then like you can, you can report that stuff on the SLC mobile app and you can get help from the city. Um, when you make a, make a homeless related request, that information comes to my team. And the first thing that we always do is we always send outreach. So we always send that over either to Jessica's team, who you just talked to, uh, or to Volunteers of America. And we try to get our outreach workers out to engage with that person first. What we want to do is we want to make sure that outreach gets eyes on them. We want to make sure that that person knows what the resources are that are available to them. 
we want to make sure that there is somebody who interacts with them first, who is service-based and who is uh, interested in making sure that that person gets to, gets to a safe place. Um, even if that person then decides that they do not want shelter uh, or they do not want to engage in services, it's still good for that person to know that there is somebody out there that they can get in contact with if and when they do want that, uh, if and when they do want that service. So that's the absolute first step. Always make sure that, that happens first. Um, then after that, if there's other things, like if there's like abandoned trash or something like that, you can put that in the SLC mobile app too, and we will send a cleaning contractor out to, uh, out to that area and they will pick up abandoned trash. If there has been bio waste that has been left uh, in an area, then that per, or that uh, contractor will come up and come out and clean that stuff up too. Um, and that's usually a pretty quick turnaround time. Uh, I think it's within 24 hours usually that they're able to get to that. If you are a private property owner and you have ended up with bio waste on your private property, we are able to clean that for you for free. That is something that we have not been able to do in the past. Um, and that is something that's part of our community commitment program. Um, and what that did is it, uh, it loosened up some money for us to be able to pay for more options for cleaning for people. And so if unfortunately you end up in that situation where you have somebody who has left bio waste on your property, we will clean that for you for free. Just put something in the SLC mobile app and let us know to send a contractor out there and we can take care of that for you. Uh, that's maybe a time limited thing. I'm not 100% sure. Um, we will see how, how much it gets used. Uh, but as of now, if, if that is something that happens, um, we, we can take care of that. Um, what it also does when you put information in the SLC mobile app with regard to homelessness is it just kind of helps us keep an eye on what's going on with different encampments. If an encampment is growing, that's always concerning uh, because that tends to lead to poorer health outcomes. If an encampment is particularly dirty, if there's like a ton of trash and a ton of bio waste and things like that, then it, might, it may need a higher level of intervention uh, than something that's pretty simple and pretty clean. Um, so it is really helpful to us as a city to have that information in the SLC mobile app. Um, there's also a desktop version, um, but the, the app on your phone is the, really the quicker way to do it. Thank you. And I, I, for those that are watching, I put that link on Facebook and we'll include it with the description when we post the recording. Nice, um, thank you. I'd like to get to two different audience questions that have come in. The first one was from Kimberly, and I am going to paraphrase a little bit, um, so I'm not asking verbatim, but Kimberly asked um, with plans, whether the, the, the airport in hotel is being closed at the end of the month, and if so, what is the plan for folks that have been utilizing that resource? Um, that is a really good question, Kimberly. Thank you for asking. We, uh, our council is actually hearing, they're in a special session this evening, starting at seven o'clock. Um, they are going to vote on, on a, uh, they're gonna vote to possibly extend the airport in program until the end of, or no, sorry, middle of June. It's the middle of June. That was actually set to expire. Uh, we had a temporary land use agreement, which is something that cities have to do uh, in order to in order to stand up shelters quickly. Um, you have to be able to kind of change your zoning. And you are only able to do that as a city, or we are only able to do that as Salt Lake City for six months at a time um, through an emergency declaration. So the council made an emergency declaration and they allowed for the airport in to be used as a shelter facility um, in December. And we know that there are still people who are staying there and who still need help. And so what we wanna do is we wanna try to extend that to the full six months, as opposed to the April 15th deadline uh, that had been originally set as part of the as part of the land use agreement. So they are meeting in an hour and 15 minutes uh, to discuss that. And we are very hopeful that that is going to pass um, and that we will be able to continue to work with the people who are staying there um, to become permanently housed. Thank you. 
Um, I want to get to another audience question from Bernie. And again, I'm paraphrasing here. Uh, but he asked how you evaluate the e effectiveness of individual programs. Um, it, in his view, uh, we tend to see what we're doing as opposed to the efficacy of what we're doing. And just wondering if you'd respond to that. That's a really good question. And I actually, um, one of the things that, uh, one of the things that I actually just learned uh, not too long ago was about the um, the rate of exits to permanent housing from shelter. Um, for people who were living in the downtown shelter versus people who are now living in the homeless resource centers. And I'm sorry, I don't have those numbers off of the top of my head, but it was something like about 87 people who left uh, in the last year that the downtown shelter was in existence. It was about 87 people who left to a permanent housing destination. So that means 87 of those people were moved out of that location and into permanent housing from that shelter. The most recent count from the homeless resource centers was somewhere around, I wanna say 250. Um, so that is a huge increase. That's a big, uh, that's, that's, a, that, that's a big impact, I will say, um, to our system. When you have a system that is very focused on outflow and very focused on getting people into housing, that's the number that you want to see go up and you want to see it go up more and more and more consistently. There's always challenges, I will say, with trying to gather data on people, particularly with low barrier shelters. Um, it's tough because people will just take off and you don't know sometimes where they go. Um, but uh, what you want in a homeless resource center is you want a lot of case management, you want a lot of engagement, you want to know as the shelter operator where people are leaving to and you really want that to be that permanent destination. Um, so that is a, that's like the main thing that we can point to to say that these homeless resource centers are being effective. Um, they are housing more people now than they were two years ago, uh, than the system really was um, two years ago. We've seen quite an increase in people leaving uh, to those permanent destinations, and that is great to see. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask one question. Uh, there, there's been two items in the news recently. One is on the homeless services dashboard that's on the Salt Lake City website. Could you mm -hmm. explain what that is? Yeah, so that what that is, is it is a look at um, what the shelter utilization is in the homeless resource centers. Um, the, there's always there's always a question um, about how much shelter is enough shelter. That's a really difficult balance to strike, I think, for any community. I don't know that any community completely has it figured out. It's not formulaic, like you really can't. Uh, you, it, it's tough to predict um, those kinds of things when you're trying to plan a system. Um, but what we can look at is our rate of utilization and whether or not people are accessing the homeless resource centers in the way that we believe that they should. Um, one of the things that I like to tell people is that uh, Resource center utilization is a lot like ICU utilization in that it is not static. People leave, people get housed, people resolve their homeless crises on their own, and this happens all day long. There is a, there is no point at which you can say like this is like the shelter is full. There is like a, like it's just there. Um, it's it's ever flowing. Uh, and so one of the things that we do do is at about two o'clock in the morning. The shelter operators go through and they look at how many people are staying in the beds that are available in the shelter. They turn that information over to the state and then the state uh, lets us put that information on a dashboard that is on our website. Um, there's also very similar to ICU data, there's, not, there's an effectively full rate that is a little bit lower than 100%. It's usually around about 95% that is that effectively full point. And that's because we know that there is this ebb and flow throughout the day. Um, you, you don't wanna go over your uh, amount of people that you are able to shelter in that location. Um, but there may be between the hours of 12 o'clock and five o'clock, um, there may be a certain number of people who leave to go to work. There may be another number of people who come in because they came in late. 
uh, and that kind of thing. And so it's really to be able to flux in the way that you need to, to be able to serve all of the people who need shelter, you really kind of have to put that effectively full rate a little bit lower than 100%. Um, lately, what we have been seeing is that we're hitting closer to like 83, 85, 87. Um, and what that means is that people are uh, just not utilizing shelter at the same rate. We see that tend to happen as the weather gets warmer. Um, people seek alternative places. We also see that happening towards the beginning of the month because people get checks and they decide that they want to go stay in a hotel on their own or something like that. Um, so we, we pay very close attention uh, to what that utilization rate really looks like um, and just make sure that if there are tweaks that end up needing to happen to the system, like if, if we need to change something to make it easier for people to come in, if we need to change our enforcement approach because there are a lot of people in the shelter um, and they really can't take in more people, then that's something that we consider too. Thank you. Um, we got another audience question from Wendy, and again, I'm paraphrasing, but Wendy asked if where, where we should be making public investments of money. So should we be focusing on investing in housing options or is uh, an investment in case management, maybe deposits for housing and other smaller barriers, if you will? Mm -hmm, that is such a good question. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> I appreciate that question so much. Uh, if there aren't units to move people, if there's not subsidy and there isn't units to move people into, then we're not going to get what we need. We're not going to get the outflow that we need and we're not going to be a successful homeless services system. So in, investing in housing is so important. It is absolutely like the key um, to, getting, to getting people through that system and getting them stable. Uh, additionally, and uh, just as important, we do need to focus on being able to provide crisis services for people. And there's a balance to strike there. Uh, is there, do you focus on housing or do you focus on shelter? Um, we have, as a community, focused quite a bit on shelter. Um, and we are very encouraged at the city to see more and more federal investment and more and more state investment in affordable housing. Um, that is something that has been absolutely necessary. It's something that the city has been investing in for quite some time and have not, we haven't gotten the same sort of investment on the state and the federal level. Now that we're starting to see that those things come in, I think we're going to start to see some real effective positive change in people's lives. Thanks, Michelle. Um, my, I, I'm going to close audience questions for now. I have two final questions to get to. Um, first, Today it was announced that former um, president of the Senate, Wayne Niederhauser, has been appointed as the state homeless services coordinator. And I'm wondering how your office envisions working with that new state office that was created by state legislation. Certainly. We already work very, very closely in partnership with both the county and the state. Um, and we're just excited to have a to have a homeless services coordinator at the state level, somebody who will be really engaging with the philanthropic uh, community and making sure that uh, that um, those people who have means in our community are supporting those who don't. Um, I think that that's going to be a huge, uh, a huge positive, a huge plus uh, that comes from that comes from that office. And then also, I think just helping us to make sure that all of our systems are coordinated. Um, there has been a lot of work that has happened over the past year to get municipalities to coordinate better with each other and to get counties um, and other cities and other places throughout the state to coordinate better. Uh, and I think that that is just going to improve and continue with this new office. Well, thank you so much. And I, I like to end on a positive note. I think we've asked a lot of different questions today, but I'd like to end with a, a story of success or something that has inspired you in your work in this role. That's a really good question. Um, I think so. Uh, one thing that has been really cool that my team has been able to do is we've been able to put together resource fairs uh, for people who are living encamped. Um, and it is so cool 
to see our service provider community come out and meet people where they're at. Uh, we've been able to engage lots and lots of different agencies to come out to uh, meet with people who are experiencing homelessness who are out on the street. Um, we've actually been able to engage the courts. So the Salt Lake City Justice Court and the Third District Court, they come out and they hold court at encampments. Uh, and that has been really cool. Um, that has gone a long way towards uh, uh, getting people's warrants cleared up and getting them kind of on the path to feel like they can better engage with the system. Um, most recently, actually, we've been able to partner with the Salt Lake County Health Department to provide COVID vaccines at those homeless or at those resource fairs. And that's the Johnson & Johnson, the one-shot vaccines, which is a lot better for people who are uh, living a more sort of uh, like living unsheltered and are kind of going from here to there. Um, that has, uh, uh, that's been a really, really positive effect uh, that we've been able to have on our community. And uh, I think that it's so cool to see people coming out and meeting people where they're at and providing services to them on site uh, and really improving their lives and helping them. Well, I, I really appreciate that. I appreciate the work that you do in the community. Um, obviously, this is an area where there's a lot of interest and we'll want to have continuing conversations with you, but thank you so much for your time today. Uh, we're going to go ahead and wrap up the live stream now. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thank you, Turner. I'm happy to come back anytime. All right, you take care. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.